Hi, my name is Tomer Arnon, and I'll be talking about formal verification of neural networks and a package called neuralverification.jl. Neural networks are uh, general function approximators, and they're used uh, in a wide variety of applications spanning from computer vision to robotic control, um, and in particular in domains that are traditionally difficult for computers. Although the networks are built up uh, of simple building blocks, because of their complicated structure, it can be very difficult to prove certain input-output prop input properties hold on these networks. And we'd like to be able to do this, um, especially as these networks uh, occupy a greater role in critical applications. I would like to mention that the field of neural verification is quite new. Uh, the first sound and complete method, I'll mention what those mean in a moment, uh, was published only about four years ago. Neuralverification.jl uh, is a Julia package with 18 sound uh, algorithms implemented. It accompanies a survey that we conducted that covers these methods. Um, and I'd like to say, since this is JuliaCon, uh, that rather than use pseudocode in that survey, oftentimes we use the Julia code unaltered uh, in its place, which is kind of neat. Um, so a, a bit about the survey. Our goal was to introduce a unified mathematical framework for this problem and to taxonomize the approaches, to figure out how they relate to one another um, and uh, how this field is growing in different directions. Uh, we also wanted to approach the algorithms pedagogically. We wanted this to be a pedagogical tool, ultimately, and to help open up the field. Um, this is just a, a snippet from the, from the GitHub page of the package. OK, so briefly, uh, what is a neural network? Um, a neural network is made up of a series of layers. Each layer has uh, a linear step uh, represented by a series of weights and biases and a nonlinear step. Um, the nonlinear step in our case is usually ReLU, uh, called it, uh, the rectified linear unit is what that stands for, and all it does is it sets negative values to zero, and that's it. Um, for the sake of notation, I'll also mention we call the input to the network always x, the output is always y, and the uh, internal state, if you will, of the network that's being passed from layer to layer, we call z hat prior to activation and z. Uh, post-activation. Okay, now what is verification? Uh, this is the verification problem here. For all x in some input set x, uh, y, meaning f of x, f being the, the neural network, must lie in some output set y. We can imagine this in the context of image classification by saying uh, for some radius in image space around a particular image, we would like the label not to change. We've all seen this sort of example where some small perturbation uh, will vastly throw off a classification network. And we'd like to be able to show formally um, that for a particular network, perhaps even a particular image or set of images, um, that is impossible. Um, we can also imagine this in the context of a safety critical system. For example, um, maneuvering an airplane. And we'd like certain nonsensical outputs to be impossible in given situations. For example, here where the intruder is on the left, we would like to be able to prove formally that the network will never output the, um, the direction left, that the plane should turn left. We can imagine that if it was possible for it to do that, that could be disastrous. OK, so why don't we just sample a lot of points and, uh, and call it a day. Um, the problem with doing this is that neural networks are very uh, spiky, as we can see here. Um, and so this kind of statistical validation is, uh, is brittle. We would like to be able to prove in many of these safety critical systems that uh, something is impossible, truly impossible, not just statistically uh, unlikely. So, um, oh, briefly, I mentioned soundness and completeness. I'll just define them. Um, soundness means uh, that there are no false negatives. It means that your algorithm will never tell you that the network is uh, safe, if those are the terms that we're using, uh, if it's unsafe. Completeness means that uh, there are no false positives. So the, the network will never be, uh, the algorithm will never tell you the network is unsafe. Uh, if it is, in fact, safe. We chose to explore algorithms that err on the side of caution, which means we would rather have uh, false positives than false negatives. Is there, is there are three ways, three basic ways, that a network can fail the verification test. The first is that we find a counterexample. We find some point in the input set, in the input, uh, set that maps to a point in the output space that is not in the output set, and, and therefore uh, the property is, is violated. Um, in other cases, we can find a radius in the input set 
um, which, uh, or, or sorry, we can map the, the output set backwards and find that uh, there is a radius in the input set which violates the, um, violates the property. Finally, and this is the one we'll focus on, is uh, we can forward propagate the input set as a set, not as a series of points, through the network and uh, determine whether that reachable set ultimately lies in the allowed set. In this case, it doesn't, and therefore uh, the network has, has failed the property, or the, the property is violated, is what we say. There's also three basic approaches we can take to do this. We can uh, use reachability, uh, we can use optimization, and we can augment these two with a search strategy. And we'll look uh, mostly at reachability, but I will mention a bit about optimization as well. Okay, so how does reachability work? Well, we have our input set. We perform a linear transformation on an affine map, uh, meaning rotation, scaling, uh, and translation. And we can do that with the weights and biases. We get z hat from that. Then we do the nonlinear step, which is the complicated uh, piece of the operation. For ReLU, what ReLU does is it projects the negative portions of the set onto the axis. Here, it may be hard to tell, but there's actually a little tail right here from this set. We repeat this, uh, these operations throughout each layer until we encounter the ultimate uh, reachable set here. There is a problem with doing exact reachability, as we showed uh, before, which is that the number of sets that you need to keep track of grows potentially exponentially with each layer. Every time you project, you end up with these sort of, or you can end up with these sort of tails. And because this is no longer a convex set, you have to represent it as the union of sets, and you have to keep track of each member of that union separately. The worst case uh, complexity of this becomes two to the n, where n is the number of nodes in the network. Uh, since these networks are very, very large, that is uh, entirely untenable. So what do we do? Um, one approach we can take is split and join. So every time we split and then project these sets to get this, we then join them again, over-approximating them with some other set, and now we're back to one. Now we only have to keep track of a single set, but the price we pay is um, over-approximation. We no longer have a complete algorithm, uh, although it is still sound. Another thing we can do is we can use interval arithmetic to uh, over-approximate earlier in the operation. So here, after the rotation, uh, we over-approximate here, which makes the projection step very cheap. Uh, but again, the price that we pay is over-approximation. Um, another thing we can do uh, to, to try to minimize this over-approximation is we can uh, propagate through the network a symbolic interval, uh, a symbolic input rather than uh, a concrete interval with, with concrete values and hope that certain cancellations take place that will minimize the, um, the over-approximation. Here we see an example, a, a trivial example of that. And in practice, the various algorithms use a combination of these techniques. Okay, I want to look at a case study um, from the reachability algorithms called AI squared. AI squared employs uh, split and join. And uh, the original AI squared paper described uh, several domains that AI squared can uh, work on, abstract domains is what they call them, which is a geometric template that is used to perform the over-approximation. You can use a hyper-rectangle as the uh, over-approximating shape, which is very cheap to do, therefore very scalable, but also very over-approximate. You can use a zonotope, which is a shape that is um, symmetric with respect to a set of basis vectors, but the basis vectors are arbitrary, so it is <clears throat> more general than a hyper-rectangle, still relatively cheap, still over-approximate though. Um, or you can use uh, um, take the, the convex hull, essentially, of the, the union of shapes that we saw before, ending up with a general polytope, um, which is the most precise. It is still an over-approximation, but it's more precise, um, but it scales more poorly in higher dimensions. So, um, I'd like to, to show what this looks like to implement AI squared in Julia. Um, and this is taken straight out of neural verification.jl. So the first thing we need is some generic reachability tools to be able to do this. We have to know how to push a set through a network. And the way that we do that is that we loop over each layer in the network and we call forward layer with the input set uh, and the way and each layer. And the output, sorry, the output here Z of each layer becomes the input to the next layer. So we just keep overwriting Z. Um, forward layer uh, consists of two steps, the linear step, which produces Z hat, and the activation step which uh, produces z, and we return them both. In this case, we only care about z. The last thing that we need is a way to check whether uh, the reachable set lies in the allowed 
uh, outward set. And we just use is subset straight out of lazy sets for that. Okay. So now that we have this, we can define our AI squared. Um, the solve step of AI squared will be fairly trivial. You compute the reachable set using forward network, and then you check the inclusion of that reachable set. So now all we need is to define a forward linear set and a forward, activate, uh, forward act step, which is the activation function. How do we do those two operations? So for the zonotope domain, it's quite uh, simple, as you see, two one-liners. Um, the linear step is an affine map straight out of lazy sets, and the activation step is to over-approximate the rectification, which is another word for ReLU, um, and we over-approximate as a zonotope, both of these straight out of lazy sets. And that's it. This is the zonotope domain of AI squared. And with a bit of multiple dispatch, we can also define the hyperrectangle and H polytope versions, or the, the polytope versions of AI squared just as easily. Um, and so you see this is the entire algorithm of AI squared implemented in just a couple of slides. Um, I will mention we use uh, the concrete operations, such as affine map, uh, rectify, etc. Um, there is room for laziness to use the lazier operations uh, found in lazy sets, but we don't do that here. Um, there is some room for optimization uh, doing that. Okay. Another case study, at least a partial case study that we'll see, is ReluVal, which uses iterative interval refinement. Um, the way that it works is that you take your entire, you start with your input set, and you propagate, the, propagate it through the network using reachability in a very over-approximate way, something that's very fast and cheap. And you end up here, because it's so over-approximate, you don't know if you're violating the property or not. You just know that it's, it's not in the output side, so it should violate. So what you do is you split. You find the interval, you uh, split it in half, find the left side holds, the right side is still violated. So of course you split again, this time top and bottom. We find that this half hold, we find that this half holds. Every time you split, um, the over-approximation decreases. And so um, using this search strategy, we can uh, um, reduce the number of, or reduce the complexity of the computations that we have to do while still um, keeping these relatively precise uh, as we refine. Um, I did want to mention on, on this slide, on these slides, uh, as I mentioned before, we use uh, Julia code as, uh, as a standard for pseudocode in the paper. And so you can see here um, just how simple and how this would be no clearer if we were to use pseudocode. It's, uh, it's as good as it gets practically. So we use code almost identical to this in the, in the survey. Um, we'll look at ReluVal for just a moment. Uh, we won't go through it the way we did with AI squared, but I just want to point out that this al the algorithm we just saw visually uh, is still very discernible here. Um, you have some list of intervals of, of uh, sets. You take one, take an interval, propagate it through the network, check inclusion of that uh, reachable set. Um, and if it is unknown, if the result is unknown, you bisect the interval. In this case, it uses this value called the smear, which is described in the initial ReluVal paper. Uh, what it is exactly is not important, uh, but I do promise it is uh, readable Julia code all the way down. Okay, I do also want to briefly mention how the optimization approaches work, uh, which is that we define an optimization problem with some objective and the constraints that x must lie in the input set x, y must not lie in the output set y, so we're in search of counterexamples, and yet y is f of x. So if all three, these three constraints hold simultaneously, we have found a counterexample. Um, and the, we can define this as a feasibility problem with no objective, or we can use the objective to help uh, guide our search. Um, this in particular here, y equals f of x, is quite tricky uh, to define. And the reason is um, that ReLU is a nonlinear, non-convex operation. So what we tend to do is relax it in some way, either uh, this triangular relaxation, which is convex, or as parallel relaxation, also convex, um, or we could use a mixed integer encoding to switch off which branch of the ReLU we are in. And different, uh, the different algorithms use different approaches in terms of what uh, encoding to use, and there's, they trade off uh, precision, scalability, and so on. Okay, another quick uh, case study here is we'll look at NS Verify which is sound and complete and also uh, intractable in most cases, as sound and complete methods tend to be. Not always, though. Um, and it defines the, it's a feasibility problem. It defines the constraints uh, x and x, y not and y, and y equals f of x, and in search of counterexamples. It uses a mixed integer linear program. 
Uh, we won't go through the code. The one thing I do want to mention is that we use uh, lazy sets in conjunction with jump for the optimization methods. And so, for example, here, uh, this function add set constraint internally um, looks like this. Um, and this is taken straight out of the library. It's exactly what it looks like. And we use uh, two simple href, for example, uh, here to um, constrain z to lie within that set. So add set constraint on a particular set will constrain the variable z, the input variable in this uh, in this case, this is the first variable um, to, oops, to lie in uh, in the set that we like. Um, and so you, again, multiple dispatch along with the functionality in lazy sets makes this uh, just endlessly expressive and makes the code um, very readable, very simple, very modular. Okay, I think that's all I'll have time for. So I, I uh, wanted to wrap up and say that what we set out to do with this project was to create an entry point, uh, a reference uh, tool, and also to provide insight um, with these various methods, how they fit together. We also wanted to create a pedagogical tool. That's what we wanted uh, this to be used for. Uh, and we know that it has been in a couple of instances, for example, a workshop that was led at Stanford, um, and also as part of a course at CMU called Provably Safe Robotics, taught by uh, Professor Liu, who, uh, who spearheaded this survey, who, and who was the first author. I also wanted to mention before wrapping up some open problems uh, in the field. Um, there are still many. Uh, we have to generalize to more general networks. Uh, we pretty much only deal with feed-forward, fully connected networks. Um, with piecewise linear activations, and anything that deviates from that is uh, very difficult, very hard to deal with at the moment. We also uh, have a problem with scalability. Real networks are very large, and they're only getting bigger. Um, and these methods uh, really can't deal yet with any practical real-world networks, almost at all. Some, some smaller networks, they can. We also have a problem with uh, expressiveness. The kinds of properties that we can define in terms of these input-output sets um, are quite limited. We'd like to be able to say things and prove things about the set of all cat photos or the set of all safe actions, but we don't even know how to describe these things. And they may be impossible to describe. Um, but certainly some work uh, needs to take place in terms of uh, this expressiveness and what we'd like to prove. Um, I'll go ahead and skip the conclusion slide uh, and, and put up this acknowledgement slide. There are plenty of people to acknowledge the uh, CARS Institute at Stanford all of the authors of the original uh, papers we cited in our survey, and of course, in particular, Marcelo and Christian for uh, organizing this mini-symposium, for inviting me to speak at this mini-symposium, uh, and for their ongoing implementation support throughout the project. Uh, I'd also like to thank my advisor at Stanford, Professor Kokendorfer, and also uh, Professor Liu. Since there's no room for questions in this format, uh, here's my contact info. Feel free to get in touch. Um, thank you, and enjoy the rest of your JuliaCon.